All right, burgeoning viewers, one quick note for you. A subscriber a day in October, if we hit 31 subscribers in 31 days, one lucky subscriber will walk away with the entire Modern Horizons art card series. Additionally, a comment a day, any subscriber that leaves a comment in every video posted by MTG Burgeoning during the month of October will become eligible for the November Pack Wars. On November 1st, a list of all subscribers that left a comment on every MTG Burgeoning video during the month of October will be compiled, and from this list, one subscriber will be randomly chosen to participate in the November Pack Wars. So hope for peace, but prepare for war. Burgeoning community, you have returned once again. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you taking the time to click onto this video and continue to budget build with Isamaru, Hound of Conda. <laughs> Welcome and salutations, MBTG burgeoning community. You are here for our continuing series of Building on a Budget with Isamaru Hound of Kanda. Our favorite legendary doggy is a 224 White. And if you are a little late to the party, you can click on any of the links below to get you caught up to where we are currently with the deck list. As a brief review, here are the cards that we've already included into the deck. We began by including what we can consider 12 of the most important cards that will make up and comprise the core of this deck. As we have Isamaru as a Voltron commander, we're adopting a Voltron strategy, equipment, auras, and these first 12 cards are going to help with that engine. All right, so here we go. As a review, we have Sigarda's Aid, Shram Senior Edificer, Danitha Capuchin Paragon, Pure Steel Paladin, Mesa Enchantress, Open the Armory, Open the Vaults, Argivian Find, Sun Titan, All That Glitters, Hero's Blade, and Gift of Immortality. These were our first 12 cards that were added to the deck. In last week's video, the MTG burgeoning community was tasked with putting together a list of 12 equipment spells that could be added to this build totaling under $10 based upon market price on TCG Player, and no equipment could cost more than $2. And these were the 12 equipment. Grafted War Gear, Ronin War Club, Black Blade Reforged, Stratoscythe, yeah, let's get a little of that foiling in there, Luxodon Warhammer, Helm of the Gods, Mirror Shield, Trailblazer's Boots, Prowler's Helm, Haunted Cloak, Chariot of Victory, and Fire Shrieker. Those were the next 12. And from last week's video, the MTG Burgeoning community was tasked once more with coming up with a list of 12 aura spells. Very similar parameters to our equipment spells. They had to total no more than $10 over at market price TCG player, and no aura could, cast, could cost more than $2. So here are the 12 auras that we're going to include in our Isamaru Voltron budget build commander deck. Armored Ascension. Three and a white, Enchanted Creature gets plus one, plus one for each planes we control and has flying. Now the casting cost is a bit more than I really wanted to commit to a, an aura, three and a white. It currently is one of the most expensive spells in our entire deck. But giving it evasion with flying and plus one, plus one for each planes we control, and we're going to have a ton of planes... I just felt Armored Ascension was a necessity to include. Now, unfortunately, we cannot recur this with our Sun Titan, but we have other spells and ways in which to get it back. So Armored Ascension is aura number one to be included. 
Number two, Ethereal Armor. For a white, this aura gives enchanted creature plus one, plus one for each enchantment we control and has first strike. So there are some similarities between this aura and the equipment from last week, Helm of the Gods. Although Helm of the Gods does not give equip creature for strike, it is an enchantment matters spell. So is Ethereal Armor, and hopefully we will have some enchantments out there in play in order to boost the power and toughness of whichever creature is enchanting it. Number three, Spirit Mantle. One in a white, this aura gives equipped, cre I'm sorry, gives enchanted creature. I don't want to go back in time to last week's video, so let's stay on task here. So, e enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one, and has protection from creatures. Protection from creatures is just an easier way to say unblockable. So, Spirit Mantle is in with a modest power and toughness boost, but another way in which to give our doggy unblockability. All right, aura number four, Hyena Umbra. For one white, each quit enchanted creature. I almost did it again. I almost did it again. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one, and has first strike. Um, didn't we just do that one? Anyways, uh, Hyena Umbra has the totem armor mechanic, which means if, if enchanted creature would be destroyed, instead we remove all damage from it, if there is any, and then we destroy this aura. So we kind of have a get-out-of-jail-free card of sending our commander back to the command zone. All right, so that is number four, Ihina Umbra. Number five, acting as a placeholder until a, a, a different aura becomes available. We have Blessing. For two white, Enchanted Creature gets for every white we tap, plus one, plus one until end of turn. Admittedly, this aura is a place setter for some time in the future when Daily Regimen becomes available. Daily Regimen is an, is an enchantment for one in a white. We put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. Unfortunately, a copy of that currently is unavailable, so Blessing will be its placeholder until that card makes its way to our deck. And we are nearing the halfway point with our auras for this for this uh, subset of cards. And number six, we're going to one of MTG Burgeoning's favorites, folks. We're going back to Shadows over Innistrad, and we are going to talk about Griff's Boon. For a white, enchanted creature gets plus one, plus zero, and has flying. So we get a modest power buff. We get some evasion. But more importantly, it has a built-in recurrable ability. We can tap three in a white. Come on, camera. What are we doing here? Oh, I can't wait to get a new camera. What is that? There we go. Three in a white. Return Griff's Boon from our graveyard to the battlefield attached to target creature. Now, unfortunately, we can only activate this ability anytime we could cast a sorcery. But still, it's a recurrable aura that gives our creature, gives the enchanted creature, evasion and plus one, plus zero. Worth it to include. Plus, it only costs one to re enchant. All right, we're at our halfway points. And continuing with the theme of getting auras out from the graveyard, because let's face it, we're going to have some auras get into the graveyard. We have Sentinel's Eyes from Theros Beyond Death. Again, for the casting cost of just one white, Enchanted Creature is going to get plus one, plus one, and has Vigilance. However, it also has the escape mechanic. And in order to escape it, we must cast. We can cast this card from our gri or from our graveyard for its escape cost. And its escape cost is a white. And then we exile two other cards. So that is not as, you know, intensive of a resource investment as Griff's Boon. And plus, Sentinel's Eyes gives it the underrated evergreen word of vigilance. And I do like vigilance. So Sentinel's Eyes is in the number seven spot. Number eight, we have an aura that does not give any power boosts, does not give any toughness boots, but boy, oh boy, does it bring the evergreen. Like Christmas Day, baby. Asha's Favor, two and a white. Enchanted Creature has Flying, First Strike, and Vigilance. So we can just park on our battlefield, attack through the air, stay untapped with Vigilance, and then just wait as a blocker with First Strike. Asha's Favor brings the offense and the defense, and it is an awesome inclusion into this deck. 
All right, so the bottom third of our auras for this subset of cards. Number nine, we're going all the way back to judgment for unquestioned authority. For two and a white, so when unquestioned authority comes into play, we draw a card. An enchanted creature has protection from creatures. And like we talked about earlier with Spirit Mantle, giving a creature protection from creatures is pretty much just saying, hey, this creature is unblockable. And plus the bonus of a card draw, it replaces itself upon entering the battlefield. Worth it. All right, here's one. Number 10, Flicker Form. For one and a white, we enchant creature. And then for two and two white, we can exile enchanted creature and all auras attached to it. At the beginning of the next end step, we return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. And if we do, return the other cards exiled this way to the battlefield under their owner's control attached to that creature. So this can dodge removal, this can dodge a board wipe, this can dodge unwanted um, combat damage and keep all of the auras attached to the creature once it comes back into play. Flicker Form is a sneaky, sneaky good card in this deck, and it's very, very economical to pick up. One in a white. Now, granted, the ability for two and two white, it could be a little mana intensive, particularly in the early game. But in the mid to late game, if we're playing a land every turn, Flicker Form could end up becoming a win condition for us. All right, our last two, number 11. We're going all the way back to Mercadian Masks. That's back in the 1990s, folks, with Inviolability. One and a white prevent all damage that would be dealt to enchanted creature. Now notice the text on this aura. It says prevent all damage, not just combat damage. So this will survive a chain reaction, a blasphemous act, a comet storm. This will survive any kind of red damage dealing board wipe. This survives, or the creature will survive any kind of combat damage. Inviolability doesn't do anything for power boosts or toughness boosts or provide any kind of keyword or evergreen mechanics. However, preventing all damage to our commander, that's valuable enough to include. All right, and what is the 12th and last aura to be included into this subset of cards? Spirit Loop. Similar to inviolability, this doesn't do anything to boost the power or toughness of enchanted creature. However, when enchanted, creature, when enchanted creature deals damage, we gain that much life. So it gives enchanted creature a lifelink. And when spirit loop is put into a graveyard from play, we can return spirit loop to our hand. So this kind of has a rancor mechanic in that it can't ever stay in the graveyard unless there is removal specifically targeting spirit loop. Okay, actually that won't even work because even if it's on the battlefield, the only way that this is gonna stay in our graveyard is if we're discarded. If we have to discard it or if it finds its way into our graveyard from a mill strategy. So even if it's on the battlefield and it has targeted removal, aside from it being exiled, of course, goes to the graveyard, it goes right back to our hand. Now, Lifelink, you know, it's outside of a Lifelink-focused EDH commander deck. Lifelink has some value to it. For me personally, this is more of a meta-specific selection. There are not a lot of Voltron strategy decks in my current metagame. I mean, there's a few. There's Goto, the Tiger or the Warlord Bandit. There's uh, Akrama, or I mean, Akroma, Angel of Wrath, um, Skullbriar, the Walking Gray. But aside from a few of those decks, there are no other really uh, Voltron strategies that I have to worry about. So I don't have to really consider taking too much lethal commander damage. It's going under 40 from just regular combat and direct damage spells that it's most important for me to avoid. So specifically including a spell like Spirit Loop where it keeps coming back, coming back, coming back and allowing me to gain life as long as I get it onto a creature is a lot more beneficial. So from a meta-specific standpoint, Spirit Loop comes in at number 12 and it is an important inclusion and its, it's value is justified in this deck. All right, so that's it. Those are the first three dozen of our 99, not including our general leader commander, of course. So now we're going to look for our next dozen. And what we're looking for with our next 12 is let's get some creatures. Let's get some creatures into this deck. We need to have more than just 
the creatures in our first 12 and our commander. So let's look for a dozen creatures. Let's keep the CMC low. Let's say CMC three or less. And let's make sure we can get as much evasion as possible because if for some reason Isamaru is incapacitated or is in the, <laughs> the command zone for the 13th time and we have to turn to some other creatures to become enchanted or carry some equipment, we want to make sure there's some built-in evasion there. Um, any kind of creatures that ramp us up or draw us cards will also be great. And any creatures that have some defensive abilities that might act as hosers to our opponent's strategies, those are all going to be wonderful additions as well. And similar to the auras and similar to the equipments from last week, these 12 creatures should not come in at a total of $10 or more. And Optimally, each creature will be less than a dollar, and no creature should be more than two dollars, with this exception. The following creature I'm going to give you is going to be creature number one added to this subset of cards. It is a little over two dollars, so it's going to put a little bit of a strain on our budget for these creatures, but I'm pretty confident that we can still get it done. This is going to comprise a little less than 25% of this ten dollar budget, so... We are tasked with a great deal of discount shopping. However, this inclusion is absolutely worth it. Coming in at a little over $2 and creature number one to be added in advance of next week's video where we unveil the other 11 creatures that are going to be added is Aven Mind Sensor. For two and a white, it's a flying flash bird that comes in with the play with a 2-1 body. And if an opponent would search a library, that player searches the top four cards of that library instead. This checks so many of the aforementioned boxes. The CMC is very manageable at two and a white. It has evasion and it has flash. So there's definitely the offensive capability to be enchanted and to carry some equipment. And additionally, as a massive defensive bonus, we really hose our opponents from searching their libraries, which let's be honest, this is EDH. Who doesn't search their libraries? How would you like to flash in an Avon Mind Sensor after an opponent casts a Vampiric Tutor? Or how about some opponent just plays a fetch land and in response, you flash in Avon Mind Sensor? It, it's over the predetermined desirable budget for an individual creature in this deck, but it's so worth it. And we're willing to risk the other 75% budget on the other 11 creatures just to include 25% here on Avon Mind Sensor. So that is creature number one. And folks, the MTG Burgeoning, you are tasked with leaving comments below or over at the tappedout.net page. Leave suggestions for up to the next 11 creatures that you would include in this Isamaru budget build. This is MTG Burgeoning. You will go forth. You will enjoy this day. Want to become a Pack Wars combatant? Four easy steps. Step number one. Click on the link below in the description or go to www.buymeacoffee.com slash MTG Burgeoning. Step number two. Select either membership or support. Membership will enroll you into Pack Wars for $5 each month. Support will cost $5 for one month. Step number three, complete payment information. The name you use will appear on the site. Use your real name, use your YouTube handle, or use no name at all and be anonymous. Be sure to include your email address in the information. Step number four, most importantly, prepare for war.